It's Ocean Drive in Coney Island. Ocean Drive is the only luxury rentals in New York with a spectacular ocean view. You wake up in the morning and breathe that ocean air. I'll certify that you're going to live 10 years longer. When I became successful, I wanted to live on the ocean. If you have worked hard, you deserve an apartment on Ocean Drive, too. Go to OceanDriveNYC.com and reward yourself. If you're a policeman, fireman, doctor, nurse, or teacher, you qualify for a limited-time offer at Ocean Drive NYC. C.com. Terms and conditions apply. In the squadron, they called him Bullets, but we call him Greg Kelly. Greg Kelly is on the air on the Red Apple Podcast Network. Uh, I'm looking at America retaliate against Iran because, you know, Iran has been supporting attacks on our troops. We've got a bunch of troops over in Iraq. Did anybody know we had that many troops in Iraq and Syria? We got like a couple of thousand, about a thousand, maybe more. And bonds have been coming in left and right all over the place. Um, groups uh, loyal to Iran have been attacking our troops over there. And our response has been minimal to non-existent. Uh, the Secretary of Defense, boy, oh boy, talk about a guy in way over his head. Um, they just revealed this videotape of uh, our counterattack. And quite frankly, uh, I've seen bigger bonfires at Breezy Point. I've seen more impressive fireworks displays uh, around here locally in my neighborhood on the 4th of July. It just doesn't seem like we uh, responded with the impact, you know, with the retaliatory force that these people deserve. All right. Nothing makes sense. Why would we tiptoe around that? Why would we tiptoe? Anybody looking at the videotape is like, eh. Nah, we know what a bunker buster looks like. Go in there and bust it up. Um, very weak. And that's, uh, well, that's America these days, right? Weak. Weak, and it's terrible. Weak and anti-Semitic. It's happening. These attacks are disgusting to me. Absolutely, totally disgusting. And it's happening in what we were told for a little while were our most uh, vaunted, uh, valued, respected institutions the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the MIT. We would not have gotten to the moon without MIT. And we have Jewish students huddled in the library, afraid of getting assaulted because they will, if they leave the library, same thing at Harvard university, same thing at NYU. And the outrage about this is nowhere. There's no, I mean, who's going to come to the defense of the Jews here? I, 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 this is insane. It's happening. It's happening all over again. I just can't uh, fathom that. Do you remember Bubba Wallace? Who's Bubba Wallace? The NASCAR driver about, I don't know, was that three years ago? He happens to be a black NASCAR driver. And there was a story going around that somebody put a noose in his garage, as in, you know, you get out of here. You get out of here. We're going to lynch you. Now, that would have been ugly. That would have been horrible. Uh, but it wasn't real. It was fake news. <laughs> it was totally exaggerated. It was a, a a rope that you pull the garage with, right? If you don't have an automatic opener, you might have a little rope. And somebody with an imagination said, that kind of, if you squint and magnify it, could look like a noose. And every night for three weeks, you know, oh, racism in the NASCAR. And everybody stood up to support Bubba. And I supported them, too. I don't want any nooses in anybody's garage, but it wasn't a noose. But I'm saying the reaction to Bubba and the fake noose was more intense uh, and more supportive, more support, more sympathy for Bubba, the love sponge. No, that's another guy. Bubba, the race car driver, than for all of these Jewish students and not just students, professionals, children, uh, moms and dads, you name it, they're feeling the heat right now because our establishment, our culture, our sick society is somehow siding with the savages over there. The savage and oh, the savages. How can you call the pal? I'm calling them savages, the ones who beat up the dead corpse of an Israeli soldier and they did it with glee. All surrounding and celebrating and shooting off those stupid weapons and yelling like crazy. You can look it up. That's happening right now. A group of people who would take women and children hostage. These are absolute monsters, absolute savages. It is black and white, good versus evil. And you got 
damn near 51, 52, 60 percent of uh, our institutions either keeping quiet or siding with the bad guys. It is disgusting. It is not America. I can't believe it's happening. It breaks my heart. It's also a wake up call. Big time. Foolishly, I thought anti-Semitism was a thing of the past, right? I mean, who would be stupid enough to be anti-Semitic? Joe Biden, anybody? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Joe Biden. Oh, boy. He has a he has a mindset about what Jewish people are like. It is ugly. It, it is a stereotype. He trades in tropes. Joe Biden himself. Um, this is actually pretty wild. So Ron DeSantis, who did not have a great night the other night, gets up and says something that, quite frankly, is a no-brainer. I totally agree with him on. Ron DeSantis, cut 14, please. And what is Biden doing? Not only is he not helping the Jewish students who are being persecuted, he is launching an initiative to combat so-called Islamophobia. No, it's the anti-Semitism that's spiraling out of control. Sorry. Yes, it is. It's a matter of fact, right? It is totally. Islamophobia, you didn't say Islamophobia doesn't exist. It's just nowhere near on the scale of anti-Semitism. It's nowhere near on the same scale. It's all over the place. And yeah, Biden did set up a task force to look at Islamophobia. You know these silly fact checkers? They're not fact checkers. They're fact cheaters. They play games with the facts. They got this guy on CNN. And every network has a little a fact checking unit, right? And basically what they do is they quibble and quarrel with anything that a Republican says and try to convince everybody that it's fake when it's not. And this is a classic example. You heard what DeSantis said. Here's CNN trying to, well, essentially lie about the whole damn thing. All right. And uh, somehow protect and promote Democrats and protect and promote the bad guys here. Yeah. The terrorists. Cut 15, please. Cut 15. Anderson, this claim is highly misleading in a couple of ways. Number one, let's note the governor's use of the phrase so-called Islamophobia. Islamophobia, hatred of fear of suspicion of Muslims, is not a so-called. It is a very real thing that people in this country have been killed over, including recently, unfortunately. It very much exists. He doesn't offer any data, does he? Right. I don't think he said it doesn't exist. Right. There's, you can find anybody afraid of anything. From spiders to Islamic people, right? There are fear. There are people who are afraid of Christians. There are people who are afraid of priests. There are people who are afraid of uh, you know, Barbie dolls. Everything. There's a thing and a syndrome for everything. And you know, offer no data. I go to the ADL, the Anti Defamation League. Three hundred eighty-eight percent increase in um, anti-Semitic violence and hate. Now you can go to you know a phony group that will say, "Well, Islamophobia is no. We see it." And we know it. We know it. And it's nowhere near on the scale as the anti-Semitism. Nowhere near. Doesn't come close. You get it? Now listen to this. The guy keeps going. Cut 16 clear suggestion here is that the president, the Biden administration, is only addressing Islamophobia and not anti-Semitism at all. And that's just not true. Uh, while the Biden administration did announce last week that it is developing a national strategy to counter Islamophobia, Biden's White House had already released its national strategy to combat anti-Semitism months ago, Anderson, in May. And that's just not true. He's been doing so much to fight anti-Semitism. In fact, in May, he announced a blue ray. In May? Uh... What's happened since May, anybody, right? Anti-Semitism in the streets of America. Don't you think any effort needs to be uh, possibly revitalized, relaunched, reconfigured? Because it's totally out of control. These people have the audacity to say that Ron DeSantis, to quibble and quarrel with him. And then what they, what they do is they put little warnings on his statements on social media. This lacks context, or this is misleading, or this is... Stay the hell out of it. These fact checkers are fact cheaters. You can hear it happening right now. Right there, right there on CNN. Anderson, let me tell you something else. And tell us more. This is a Daniel Dale or Dale Daniel is his name and uh, cut 17. We know that President Biden himself has repeatedly denounced anti-Semitism, both in the wake of this Hamas attack in October and for years before. A quick Google search I did this evening brought up numerous examples dating back years. So the pretty inflammatory suggestion here that Biden is ignoring Jews in this fraught moment in favor of Muslims after the attack is just not correct. Well, actually, um, he did ignore uh, Jews in the wake of the attack. In the key critical days, this attack happened on October 7th. On October 10th, October 11th, 
October 12th. There wasn't a word about anti-Semitism. There wasn't a word about Iran. And it was it was emerging. And that's when we needed, uh, you know, uh, Joe, the unifier, to come together and write and, and, and take care of that. Nope. Nowhere to be found. And what did that guy say? I did a quick Google search, and I found him saying this, that, and support. Well, I did a quick Google search myself, knowing that I would find, you know what? Joe, I seem to remember, has engaged in all kinds of uh, anti-black, anti-Indian, anti-you name it. And I knew there had to be an anti-Semitism in there. I just knew it. And a quick Google search. Yes, I got him engaging in one of the most hideous anti-Semitic tropes ever invented. I think this one by Shakespeare. He even knew about it. Cut 18, please. Cut 18. Joe Biden in 2014. My son is attorney general a year in Iraq, came back, and that's one of the things that he finds is was most in need when he was over there in Iraq for a year. People would come to him and talk about what was happening to him at home in terms of foreclosures, in terms of bad loans that were being, I mean, these Shylocks who took advantage of, uh, of these women and men while overseas. A, a Shylock? <laughs> a, a Shylock. Uh, Shylock, huh? Well, that is an anti-Semitic slur. Absolutely. Everybody knows. And Joe didn't say that when he was 18. He said it when he was vice president of the United States in a public forum talking about Shylocks, the notorious banker who charged uh, outrageous usury type interest rates. Right. Isn't that what he did? Let's see here. Uh, the Shylock is the fictional character in William Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Ven- Venice. A Venetian Jewish moneylender, Shylock is the play's principal villain. And he is, <laughs> this is what uh, anti Semitic people use when they want to talk badly about Jewish people. It's, it's, it, it is, it always has been. Let's see here. Uh,. Character uh, Shylock, Shylock is a slur. It is a slur, and everybody knows that. I knew it when I was f- four. <laughs> you go right there. Yep, a, a list of religious slurs. It's at the top of the list. You can't say that, but he did. And he gets the oh, it's CNN is fact checking Ron DeSantis. I also found an article going way back, but 1974. What's going on in 1974? Joe Biden is a 32-year-old member of the United States Senate. And Kitty Kelly, nationally renowned journalist, is uh, doing a little uh, day in the life of Joe Biden. And you know what he's doing all the time? (laughs) Making jokes with anti-Semitic punchlines. Jokes with anti-Semitic punchlines. Now, granted, uh, it was a different era. And, uh, you know... (laughs) You'd be shocked at what some people said out loud. But isn't a future president of the United States supposed to be better? Supposed to be better. Uh, he kept telling the reporter, hey, take that off the record. That's off the record. Take out the anti-Semitic part. That's off the record. The reporter wrote that in the story. Said, oh, it's an anti-Semitic joke, but I can't report it because he said it's off the record. <laughs> I mean, uh, wow. Yeah, how about that? I think it's... <sighs> Ooh, what are you going to do with that? Well, you have any idea? No mystery why the anti-Semitism is flourishing, right? It is totally flourishing. Oh, an important development in the case against Trump. Help is on the way, sir. I'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by the all-new 2024 Toyota Grand Highlander. Being the parent in charge of the neighborhood carpool can be intimidating. But the 2024 Grand Highlander's more spacious third row, you can be confident of the space you're in. Confident enough to handle five kids, even if you don't understand when they say things like W-Riz. Learn more at ExploreSEToyota.com. Toyota, let's go places. The most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton for the stay. Greg Kelly Kelly. on the Red Apple Podcast Network.
Hey, it's Veterans Day tomorrow. All right, Veterans Day. All the veterans out there, thank you. Right? Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. I'm proud to be a veteran myself. Um, I really am, and I'm very grateful. You know, people say thank you for your service. I feel, you know, I mean, I just, I feel, I feel thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It was amazing. I had such a great time. Very interesting. Yeah, it was hard. I mean, I'm emphasizing the positive now, right? You got to do that in life. I mean, there were plenty of things I didn't like, but overall, a fantastic experience, experience of growth, adventure, learning. And, uh, oh, by the way, I got to serve my country. All right. So, I mean, it was um, a win, 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 win. Um, now, I kind of don't like it. Well, when everybody acts like somehow the veterans are this hard up, hard luck, down on their luck outfit, right? I mean, you just kind of, that's kind of in the air. Right. Uh, I think that's kind of overstated and overblown. Any group of people, any profession, you'll find people who are, you know, down and out. And I hate it when people are down and out and we want to help everybody. But I know a doctor who went to Harvard who's down and out. You can read about him. He's in Los Angeles. He got into drugs and now he's running around. He's homeless. It can happen, you know, in any profession. But there's like this like this idea that. Ooh, veterans, you know, they're all, they're all, you know, drug addicts are all homeless. No, we're not. <laughs> veterans from all walks of life, all over the place, all over the place, doing great things. And uh, I love it. And one of the reasons why they're doing so many great things, the, the military experience, what you learn there. Um, now, granted, I learned a lot, but, you know, you are who you are. And I wrote about this in my book. Uh, There were a lot of cool things I learned about, you know, getting up early and attacking the day. And but after boot camp, I kind of went back to being my regular pre boot camp self. You know, there are certain things I did like. But you're still you. Anyway, Veterans Day is uh, is great. Great Memorial Day. Memorial Day is far more somber. You think about those who lost their lives in service to our country. Now it's just anybody who served. And uh, you know what? Um, again, proud to be one of them. My dad served, I served, my mom served actually in the Coast Guard. I think that counts. Um, and, uh, lots of people, the, uh, uh, CEO, the, uh, the boss of this radio station, Chad Lopez, he served honorably in the United States Navy. We almost crossed paths on one base, actually. Yeah. We were both based in Meridian, Mississippi, uh, for a period of time. And uh, I want to ask him if he hated it as much as I did, <laughs> Meridian. Actually, I love Mississippi, but that base was particularly harsh. It was a tough, tough, tough environment. All right, so we'll have a few uh, phone calls on that. Does anybody really like Broadway? Does anyone like Broadway? Is there any man? I want to say if there's any, well, the seats are too cramped. I have no idea what they're talking about. I can't follow the music. It's boring as hell. The worst movie is better than the best play in my book. And I got to go to a Broadway show. (laughs) How do I get out of this? I had not been to a Broadway show in a long time since uh, Beautiful. Carol King and Beautiful. I think that's the last show. Oh, I take that back. I saw The Iceman Cometh with Denzel Washington. I got to tell you, that was a hell of a show. I, I did enjoy that. The complexity. It was like, I mean, man, how are these guys getting this stuff down? And they went, it was very intense. And it's a base, a message I agree with anti alcohol, temperance, because the maniacs, the maniac star, you know, gets drunk and hurts people. Uh, very well done. But one thing about that, it was an awesome performance. Awesome, actually. It even had me. And you know how I feel about Broadway. I was not going there to be. They were done clapping. The audience was done clapping by the time the curtain came all the way down. Everybody just wanted to be on their dumb phones and walking around again. I actually got on my feet and like try to get another, you know, another encore, but couldn't pull it off. Thank you, Denzel Washington and the entire cast and crew. Welcome to the Flash Finds Podcast, the world's fastest podcast where we explore how Facebook can help you with the stuff you're into. I'm your host, Emma Rogue, and today I'm with creator and chef Chris Cho. Chris, what do people get out of your reels? 
So people are super intimidated when they want to first try cooking Korean food, but through Facebook Reels, I make it super fun and easy and accessible within a 30 to 60 second video. Reels is the cheat code. Thanks, Chris. See you next time on the Flash Finds podcast, all about discovering the stuff on Facebook you care about. Bye. Greg Kelly on the Red Apple Podcast Network. I'm supposed to be worried here. We're a week away, potentially, from a government shutdown. A government shutdown. You know what? Actually, we're uh, uh, three and a half hours away from a government shutdown. The government, as Mark Levin has pointed out, shuts down every Friday night for 48 hours. Everybody's fine. 72 hours. Everybody's fine. Uh, So much of the government is unessential, non-essential. I really don't care. It doesn't worry me. Um... Uh, this is not, and I know, I know, it, it'll look bad for Democrat. it'll look bad for Republicans, oh, we'll figure that out. Hey, I love this, Elise Stefanik wrote a really nasty letter, but a, in a good way, nasty in a good way, about Judge Engeron, the maniac judge presiding over the uh, alleged fraud trial, Donald Trump and his business pursuits. Guy's been a successful businessman his entire life, right? Up until six minutes ago, six when he gets into politics, poor guy. Uh, everybody can see that the judge is totally unhinged and weird and uh, that the damn thing is a sham. And uh, good for Donald Trump for showing up in person. I love it. He wants to confront this face to face. And it's Veterans Day. And you know what? Donald Trump did a lot for veterans decades before he went into uh, politics in the 1980s. He helped actually established the Vietnam Veterans Memorial way before that was cool, way before that became a thing. Um, And he has spoken very honestly about his own experience, having not served in the military and and thoughts about maybe he should have. It's a very interesting. I told you before, he actually said he felt guilty about not having served. Hey, we're joined by uh, a person who definitely did serve, Raymond Kelly, my father, Colonel, United States Marine Corps, 30 years he was in, including a uh, one-year one year tour of duty of combat in Vietnam. How are you, sir? Welcome back. Happy Veterans Day. Greg, it's great to be with you. And I must say, happy 248th birthday to the United States Marine Corps. Today is the day that, uh, as I say, 248 years ago in Tun Tavern, Philadelphia, the organization that you and I respect and love so much, was formed, and it's a great service for this country for all of that time. Yeah, it's amazing. It, they started it in a bar. <laughs> I think it, was, it was founded in a bar. How about that? No way. I don't think any other standing army in the world was was started in a bar, but it was. And we love the Marine Corps. We're grateful to the Marine Corps. Hey, explain to people how you were able to stay in the Marine Corps for thirty years and still be a cop at the same time. Well, I would say this. The police department uh, was very generous as far as uh, police officers staying in the reserves. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was on active I was on an active military duty for over three years and still uh, from the NYPD. I was on leave and uh, it's been very great in that way. And, uh, yeah, I was able to join the reserve units uh, to do exercises with them to be deployed during the summer. And uh, I enjoyed uh, every minute of it, quite frankly. It was a, it was a great experience for me. And the, the police department, as I say, was, you know, so so understanding as far as the reserve duty is concerned. And right now there are many police officers who are members of the active reserve. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. And uh, I remember those summers, you'd go off on active duty, we'd tag along as a family, and uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Hey, let me just ask you this. You were, in, you were in the Vietnam War. If somebody comes up to you and just asks you this question, what was that like? What was it like, the Vietnam War? What's your answer to that? Well, like, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about uh, an answer. Uh, it's like... Uh, you know, probably any war is is the times of uh, boredom and then uh, stark terror. Uh, you know, you come close to losing your life. You see other people who lose their lives. I mean, it's a you know, it's it's a terrible experience and yet a very uh, rewarding experience in a way. It you know it enables you, I think, to to, to be confident to take on 
just about any challenge. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, Vietnam was a uh, uh, kind of a swampy place. It was it was muddy and, and it was cold too. You can be up on top of a mountain and uh, have the wind whip through you at uh, eleven o'clock and midnight or whatever. So it was it was many things, but overall it was a what I would have to say was an enriching experience. Today, apparently, Viet, the Vietnamese are very friendly to the United States and uh, want tourists to to go there. I, I hear that a lot. I'd, I'd like to go there myself, uh, maybe one of these days. But um, it was. Uh, I'm certainly glad I I did it. Let's, let's put it that way. It was a great experience. How about that? You know what? I don't think I've ever heard that in my life, that Vietnam could be cold. <laughs> it could be cold uh, yeah. on a mountain at night. How about that? Uh, and what was it like when you got back? Uh, you know, you hear that story, uh, the, the the vets, uh, people in uniform were spat upon. I always I have a feeling that was kind of overblown, um, but but you came back. What was that experience like coming back? Yeah, I, I didn't see any of that. I, I I don't think uh, you know like Marines were were uh, affected by that. But I will tell you this: in the police department, uh, I had to police many of those uh, anti-war demonstrations, and they were you know they were pretty nasty. And it was uh, you know not unlike some of the things we see today, but today seems, seems much worse. But it was sort of incongruous to be in a position to. To be in the war and then come back and, and police people protesting uh, the war. Yeah, it was a uh, it, you know it was, it was sort of a crazy time. Certainly in the late sixties and the early seventies, there were a lot of a lot of demonstrated uh, demonstrations all over the place. How but, about uh, this today? You've become actually an expert. You've studied anti-Semitism, its roots, uh, where it flourishes and unfortunately is flourishing uh in parts of the world and i guess even here now i know you uh specialized you studied it in europe but this to me is a shock what we're seeing right now in america and are, are you shocked are you surprised to see it on such open in such open display yes i uh, I'm, I'm definitely shocked you know i did look at anti-semitism in europe and the bottom line is that uh, people said that the anti-Semitism in Europe was worse than it's been since World War II. But what shocked me now is the open manifestation of where people uh, are willing to, to associate their faith in their name to blatant anti-Semitism. I also saw in colleges here, now this is a couple of years ago, how embedded these, uh, these pro-Palestinian or should say pro Hamas uh, organizations are, and all they engaged in was harassing uh, Jewish students. And they were not about anything else but to sort of degrade and to interrupt and disturb uh, events that Jewish organizations had. And they they had well over a hundred chapters in major colleges throughout the country. So uh yeah the 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 blatantness of this is is, is shocking and uh, I I I don't know how we how we get out of this it's just uh you know it, it it's a terrible blot to on on education I think as much as anything else because that's yeah. where the heart of this uh, uh anti-semitism is I that think arises in this country is college campuses that group you talked about students for justice in palestine yeah that it, it sounds like a kind of a an, a, a an innocuous name but they're harassing jewish students on campus it's it's just unfathomable and you're right i mean look hey you're a harvard graduate harvard you went to the harvard kennedy school you have a master's Harvard. I remember when you went to Harvard. It was like, my goodness gracious, what an honor. It was, we were all thrilled, so prestigious. This stuff is flourishing at the best colleges or what we thought were the best colleges in the world. MIT, Harvard, Columbia. And I don't know. It's heartbreaking. And as you said, how do we stop it? I, I don't know. Too many people. I don't know if you remember. I was talking about this a little while ago. Bubba Wallace, he was a NASCAR driver. And the whole world freaked out when it was erroneously reported 
he happened to be black, that there was a noose in his garage. Well, it turned out to be a piece of string attached to the garage, um, you know, to pull the garage down. And I remember Lester Holt breaking news all the time, you know, uh, racism and NASCAR. And it was like, wow, we really have to do something about this. And you're not sensing that right now. No. Uh, the, the complaints and the harassment of Jewish students on these campuses has gone on for years. Yet the administration, the administrations of these schools do absolutely nothing. They look the other way. <laughs> Why? I don't know. But they do not want to get engaged in that in that issue. So this is this is something that I was surprised to find uh, was going on for such an extended period of time on on college campuses. So it's a you know it's embedded there, and we need to do a 180 degree change with our educational system as far as or these issues are concerned. For I think that this, this country to survive you know i'm i'm very worried about the future of uh, of you know usa hey dad do you remember that time we saw the guy steal the car we were in mineola you were in one car i was in another we picked up a car at laguardia airport that i think jimmy had left and all of a sudden we see a guy steal that car you remember that yeah yes what about it? <laughs> I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I just thought, first of all, I had the sense that, boy, I think that car might have been stolen. You saw that the guy busted right through a fence and you took off after him. Now, I, don't, I guess we don't have to tell the whole story here, but it was pretty damn cool to see you in action. And I've seen it now. I've seen it twice, actually, twice in the suburbs. And let me ask you this, actually. So. You're a New York City police officer at the time, and something bad happened in uh, Nassau County. I mean, one was a purse snatching. The other was a stolen car. You're authorized to take action, correct? Yeah, you're a police officer in New York State. <clears throat> the state is, is the entity that gives you the authority. So if you're in New York State and you're a police officer, sure, you can, you can take action, for, certainly for a felony, which uh, those crimes were. What if I'm speeding over the George Wa- in, in the Bronx and I take the George Washington Bridge and I go and I'm being chased by a cop and I go into New Jersey? Does he have to break pursuit? Uh, yeah, there there is there are hot pursuit uh, provisions in in the law when you go into another jurisdiction. Yes, they would probably just call the troopers in New Jersey and say, "Hey, he's coming!" Right? Yeah, they call ahead. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's, All right. The phone is a very powerful tool, very powerful weapon for. Police officers in in pursuit. Well, note to self: don't run from the cops. Don't ever try to flee. And uh, Ray Kelly, wow, um, great talking to you, my father. And um, appreciate your uh, your recollections of, of of Veterans Day. And a hey, one more quick question: because you went through boot camp at a different time than I did, what was boot camp like when you went through? Well, it was uh, pretty rough. It was a lot of physical contact, and uh, you know the Marine Corps was noted for that, and I think still is in many ways in, in a different a different approach. You're not not certainly not as uh, as much contact as there were in in, in those days. When we when you but say nobody, contact, nobody really nobody really complained about it. Well, you know you'd be grabbed, you'd be pushed around, that that sort of thing. It's unbelievable, but, but people. But and people were able to drop out. You could just, oh, that's it for me. I'm leaving. So, uh, you know, I was in the officer candidate uh, program. So, but it, it was a, uh, it was sort of a rite of passage that nobody really uh, became particularly disturbed over. Yeah, yeah. They used to, they used to actually hit candidates. They, but they don't do that anymore. I can attest to that. I went through it. They don't do it. Uh, but they, uh, they test you in other ways, and it's still a brutal. Brutal process, so think long and hard before you sign up for the Marines or any military service. But if you do, and as long as it doesn't go crazy woke, I think you're in for the time of your life or lives. So, uh, Ray Kelly, thank you very much. Say hi to Mom. I will. Uh, okay. Thank you. All right, we'll be Thanks right back. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Be right back. 
At Sephora, we know how you love to use makeup, skincare, hair care, and fragrances that work for you, but also how important it is to be in the know about the ingredients that are in them, which is why we created Clean at Sephora, curated products from brands like Merit, Amica, Summer Fridays, and Fleur that have everything you want, minus certain ingredients you might not. Clean at Sephora is only at Sephora. Shop now at Sephora.com. Hi, I'm Avantika Chilkoti, host of The Modi Raj, a new podcast from The Economist. Narendra Modi has watched over a period of rapid growth in India, but he's also the front man for a chauvinistic Hindu nationalism. Now, he's eyeing another term as prime minister. What will it mean for India and the world? I've been trying to get inside his head. Listen now to The Modi Raj from The Economist, wherever you get your podcasts. Greg Kelly on the Red Apple Podcast Network. I love Ethan and that football player. Nahimans and uh, MDA. Great stuff. Great stuff. And uh, good job, Elise Stefanik. She wrote a very pointed letter to the New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct. Because what that judge is doing, this is real misconduct. Not the phony, not the political uh, uh, witch hunt you're on with Rudy Giuliani giving him a hard time about his law licenses. Can you imagine these mutants trying to take away that man's law license? It's unbelievable what's happening. She writes, and Elise Stefanik is the, uh, she's a very sharp cookie in the U.S. Congress, a Republican from upstate New York. I write today to express my serious concerns about the inappropriate bias and judicial intemperance shown by Judge Arthur Engeron in New York's lawsuit against President Donald J. Trump and the Trump Organization. The judge's bizarre behavior has no place in our judicial system, where Judge Engeron is not honoring the defendant's rights to due process and a fair trial. These serious concerns are exacerbated by the fact that the defendant is the leading candidate for President of the United States, and it appears the judicial system is being politicized to affect the outcome of the campaign. Simply put, Judge Engeron has displayed a clear judicial bias the defendant against the defendant throughout the case, breaking several rules in the New York Code of Judicial Conduct. Last year, Judge Engeron told President Trump's attorney that the former president is just a bad guy who Democrat Attorney General Letitia James should go after as the chief law enforcement officer of the state. You know, and this goes on for several pages. And it's a great letter. It's true. At the same time, it's kind of sad. It just saddens me. Because the judge is doing it. And you know why he's doing it? You know why he can get away with this stuff? Because there should be a million letters like this. This should not, Editorial boards, columnists, people, everybody, the establishment should be rejecting this persecution of Donald Trump. But they're not because they hate him and they want They want to get him out, and they don't care if the judge breaks the law or or blows off regulations or protocol or does all this inappropriate stuff. They don't care. They want it done. They just need him out so we can get away with it. So this letter, as beautiful as it is, it took a member of Congress. It's great, but it's one little lone voice, and he could not get away with this going after a Democrat because the culture would rise up and make very similar points. They wouldn't even have to because it would not have gotten this far. You know what I mean? Uh, Nate, hello. You're in Queens. Where in Queens? Well, never mind. Nice attitude. Viviana, I no more profanity. We bleeped out the profanity. I can't believe you would just be on hold to start cursing. Wrong answer. Viviana in Brooklyn. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Greg, for taking uh, my call. No I profanity, want to okay? Wish everyone- no way. Thank you. Nah. you know, they say that profanity is a sign of a mind that doesn't have imagination. Mm. But anyway, <laughs> I wanted to thank everyone. Um, we are a military family. My uh, my husband served for 20 years in the Army. I didn't know that we were, you and your dad and, and ourselves, we consider each other family once we've served. And... Um, I just feel um, that you are being used by God to be a very important voice for the truth. So you're carrying on your military service 
through being an exceptional um, person and bringing in the truth to America. Uh, and I'm thankful for the service members and their families because they suffer a lot with all of these deployments. Um, the reason I called Greg is that my heart is broken. Uh, you had mentioned earlier in the broadcast that there's been like 40 plus attacks on American bases in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Do you know that there are at least five service members that have suffered traumatic brain injuries because of those attacks? President Trump would have leveled Iran by now. And the Biden administration is shameful for not doing all that it can do to deter Iran. What there, do you think, Greg? There, I, you know, um, you're right to a thank you, by the way. Very kind words. Um, very kind words. Viviana, you mentioned something about Iran, and it's a little bit more. I, I'm going to get do me a favor. I'm going to put you on hold for a while. Right. We're going to come back to you. I love you. Thank you. Red Apple Audio Network listeners support veterans and their families this Veterans Day by donating to the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. All you have to do is go to redappleaudionetworks.com slash T2T. The Tunnel to Towers Foundation do all they can do to support the veterans of our great country. Go to redappleaudionetworks.com slash T2T. The Red Apple Audio Network is proud to support the Lee Greenwood Concert Experience this Sunday, November 12th. You can send a veteran to this. You can send a veteran uh, you can go yourself, receive the DVD version for yourself for a $50 contribution. Learn more at AdoptAVeteran.com. That's AdoptAVeteran.com. If you're looking for plump lips at last, you need to know about Juvederm Lip Fillers. With Juvederm Volbella XE and Juvederm Ultra XE, your lip look, whether it's subtle or bold, can last up to one full year with optimal treatment and no additional maintenance. Find a licensed specialist and see if it's right for you at Juvederm.com today. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Add fullness to lips in adults over 21 with Juvederm Volbella XC or Juvederm Ultra XC. Do not use if you have severe allergies or a history of severe allergic reactions or if you are allergic to lidocaine or the proteins used in Juvederm. Tell your doctor if you have a history of scarring or taking medicines that decrease the body's immune response or that can prolong bleeding. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. As with all gel fillers, there's a rare risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. For full important safety information, visit www.juvederm.com. This is brought to you by Fruity Pebbles. Add some creativity to your mornings with Fruity Pebbles. With big fruity flavor to feed big inspirations. Fruity Pebbles turn the world into a playground. Whether you're turning ordinary paper into art or creating a culinary masterpiece, Fruity Pebbles can be the spark that ignites creativity. What are you going to yabba-dabba-do next? Head to postpebblesereal.com to learn more. Yabba-dabba-do and the Flintstones and all related characters and elements. Copyright and trademark Hanna-Barbera. Greg Kelly on the Red Apple Podcast Network. Hey, so they got that January 6th guy, Mr. Yetten from New Jersey. Uh, as far as I can tell, he didn't do a damn thing. Uh, and three years later, there's an all out was an all out manhunt for this dude. The FBI sent in like half their SWAT team, half the FBI's SWAT team. There were like 50 guys with guns and camo and all that stuff and and a little mini tank looking for this one guy who's been around for three years. They could have, he was working for the U S army. Did they just identify him and move in on him? No, I don't think so. Actually. Uh, why did they make such a federal case out of it? A militarized federal case. I looked at the charges. Well, they must be very serious, right? Very, very serious. Impeding a federal officer. Impeding a federal officer. What does that mean? Impede. Impeding. Imp imp he impeded a... Allegedly. I got a picture of him. This happened in New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Gregory Yetten was... Uh, and he turned himself in. So they didn't find him, and he turned himself in. And uh, are they going to try to send him away for 22 years? Uh, because what, he... You know, Enrique Tario didn't hurt anybody, didn't break anything. 22 years for him. So this guy, let's see here. Uh, impeding. 
a federal officer. I don't know what that means. I mean, I know what the word impeding means, but how do you impede? Do you send in the SWAT team if somebody uh, creates an impediment to anything? I don't think so. Very, very strange. I do have a picture of him on January 6th. He is outside the Capitol, and uh, he's not hurting anybody. He's not breaking anything. But he was there. Uh Uh-oh, wow. Uh, The new, what do they call it? The American Gulag. We have an American Gulag. And all these people in custody. One of them who we called on the radio a while back as uh, three years, and he hasn't even had a trial yet. Three years in federal custody. Um. You know, Black Lives Matter, you saw all those charges. If they were arrested, they were arrested and they were forgiven. They were thrown out. A lot of the protesters got money. Oh, sorry if you were inconvenienced. Here's 500 bucks. Happened here, happened in cities all across the country. Uh, because the establishment pretended to agree with the cause. They pretended to agree with the cause. They didn't really, but they don't care. The establishment really doesn't believe in anything other than the establishment. Okay? And that's important. Now, uh... This is, I mean, network news. One guy who allegedly impeded somebody. Ready for this? This is uh, the David Muir show, and they got a reporter on the scene. Cut 23, please. Cut 23. All-out manhunt tonight in this small central New Jersey town, just 40 miles southwest of New York City. After this man, wanted in connection to the attack at the Capitol on January 6th, evaded arrest. Wow. And you see all these heavy-duty guys with guns and FBI on... You know, it's one thing to be an FBI agent. You know, it used to be great. And what would those guys wear? Suits and ties, right? Now they 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 look like these ninjas with this equipment. And uh, you know, there was a time where they didn't want the police to be overly militarized. It's a little bit much. It's a lot. It's a lot much. It's a lot much. And sometimes on some of these uniforms, I see it down in D.C. a lot. I see it with the FBI. You can't tell what the hell they are. I can't tell if they're cops or good guys or bad guys. You know, you can buy a lot of that stuff commercially. You can go to the Army-Navy store and buy uniforms and stuff like that. You know, there were so many cops in riot gear on January 6th, but you couldn't tell they were cops. Hey, note to law enforcement. Write the word police on the front of your uh, 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 vest there, right? Something so we know that you're a good guy. Because who are they, Antifa? What's going on? That guy Fanon doesn't even wear a badge running around like a maniac. Fanon and the rest. Man, oh man, oh man. What a scam that turned out to be, those January 6th cops. You know, the next time I hear a SWAT raid, I want them raiding Michael Byrd's house. Lieutenant Michael Byrd, the one who shot and killed Ashley Babbitt. Then you can send in the SWAT team. Well, why there? Well, he's got a gun and he murdered somebody. So I think you send in the SWAT team. If you're going to send it to some guy who impeded somebody, I think you should send it in to somebody who murdered somebody. And it still breaks my heart. This is I. mm. There's a police department in the country that would say that that was a justified shooting, except the Capitol Police Force. And who runs a Capitol Police Force? Congress. So, you know, it's crummy. You absolutely know it's crummy. Political, weird, unprofessional. Notwithstanding all the stuff with the, uh, well, put aside the Ashley Babbitt thing, it was a total and complete failure. I knew stuff was going to happen on January 6th. You were hearing about it. Protests were going to happen throughout the country, potentially. They put one guy, one cop at Freedom Plaza. One. You think they wanted something to happen? I think they did, actually. And then they could tarnish and besmirch MAGA. And make us into a, uh, a terrorist, domestic terrorist. That's why they left the doors open. That's why they were waving people in. And you had it. You couldn't just have an insurrection. It had to be a deadly insurrection. So they killed a woman. If you go through it, again, what breaks my heart about January 6th, because January 6th was a day yeah, I was ready for it. I knew all about the Electoral Count Act of 1887. Um, I knew that there was a legal and constitutional way to make objections to the uh, election. And I wanted that to happen. But they let people inside, and some of the people, we still don't know who they are, um, and they disrupted it. Not the counting. They disrupted the objection. They, have, they, they disrupted the objections to the vote. 
And it was totally legal, totally constitutional to object to that vote, raise objections. They didn't want that to happen. And the shooting of Ashley Babbitt, you know what? That brought it to a close immediately. And people started to lose their, uh, you know, they, they went with the fake news narrative. And Kelly Loeffler, remember that mannequin from Georgia, the Republican? She immediately reverses herself and says, oh, I'm just going to certify. I'm just going to certify. I'm just going to rubber stamp it. And uh, what a shame. Hey, Viviana, uh, we were talking before. Uh, All right. So, look, you're saying that if under Donald Trump, Iran had hit those bases like they're hitting those bases now, Donald Trump would have leveled Iran? Um, I misspoke. I got very heated. I believe that he would have directed to use appropriate measures to respond to the attacks, okay? Because under him, he did not have any wars. He would have probably used diplomacy to even prevent the attack on October 7th. So I did misspeak. No, 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 no. I mean, but you want No, you want, no, you, I mean, I get it. You wanted to, you want to, yeah, but you want military force. Hey, number one, Donald Trump did use military force, Right. I mean, mm-hmm. al-Baghdadi, General Sulmani, right? So here's the thing. Here's why I didn't want to say, because she just praised me as a truth teller, and I could if we had, so I have to go down the, 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 the rabbit hole here. And thank you for your kind words. All right, people forget this, but Donald Trump took out General Sulmani, a very, very, very bad guy, uh, late in his administration. And as a counterattack, General Sulmani was an Iranian Republican Guard dude And uh, he was taken out. It was a legitimate military target, even though they try to say somehow because Trump took him out. It wasn't legitimate, but it totally was. Took him out while he was walking across the um, uh, the airport in Baghdad. Right. So they take that guy out. Iran gets very upset. And what did Iran do? They started hitting these same little bases that we have over there. Iran started hitting them, but it didn't get that much attention. And there were traumatic brain injuries. But to manage the situation. I don't think there was much of a military response, and I get that. Actually, it was in, yeah, it was in early 2020 when all this stuff happened. So there is a <laughs> – I kind of get it. I kind of get it. Look, they don't want to start World War III. We would not be in this situation if it wasn't for that stupid getting out of the – Iran, uh, uh, getting into the Iran nuclear deal and then getting into it again and giving them $6 billion and all the soft on Iran uh, policy from Biden – but I can't say it's not black and white that Trump would be pounding Iran right now for what's happening to these bases, because th- what happened to these bases happened before. And we didn't do all that much about it because big picture, it's not that intense, although it is intense. It is significant. But we had just taken out General Sumani. They were kind of a counterattack. Yes, some guys had concussions. Nobody was killed. So it's kind of on the same and Trump, I don't believe, responded in any meaningful way. And I'm actually okay with that, given that we had just taken out Suleimani. They were going to do something. So, Viviana, it's a little bit more. Okay, does that all make sense? That it makes sense uh, because of the fact that we do not want to get into the Third World War, but we're showing too much weakness in giving them the money and continuing to provide humanitarian offense. Can I make one more? Um, I'm sorry. I've taken yeah, yeah, sure. Why, why, why? Time, but can I make one more? What? Yeah. Okay. I am upset that um, our mayor is continuing to allow the same people, and I really believe that they're paid by George Soros or Iran to be mobs that are anti-Semitic going around um, New York like a replay of the summer of 2020. And, you know, and then Biden is telling us um, we need a pause, you know, for uh, for Israel. No pause until all the, the hostages are released. I, yeah, that, you know, the, you, the a, call, a caller made that point yesterday. I think it's totally you're totally correct. Uh, you don't start negotiating with these terrorists until you give over the uh, hostages. They want humanitarian assistance. We'll start acting like human beings and we'll talk about it. Uh, and you will release the women and children immediately. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. No pause, no timeout. You don't take a timeout during combat. Uh, you're totally right. The other thing, Eric Adams He's not um, he's not behind this. He's not orchestrating this. He's too dumb 
uh, to pull that off. He's got his own troubles now. He's in way over his head, and uh, he had to lawyer up because the FBI is moving in on him. So he's not orchestrating it. However, he has told the police department to back off, to let these maniacs have the right of way. You know, under my father, quite frankly, and Bloomberg, they didn't give up the Brooklyn Bridge. They didn't say, let the protesters take over. Let them uh, blow off steam. Yeah, they didn't let them take over the West Side Highway or the FDR or 14th Street or Union Square. That's what these people do. Adams, de Blasio. And you know what? You can't do that. We have a police department to prevent things from happening. Public safety. What if you're in an ambulance? What if you want to get home? What if you, 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 you we don't take a backseat to these idiots? And so they gave up. And they, they're giving up. That is on purpose. Viviana, you're amazing. I'll be right back. Greg Kelly, entertaining and informative on the Red Apple Podcast Network. Hey, I got to hear this. Joe Biden screaming randomly like a lunatic, it says, huh? He was given that speech with the goofy red sweater. Why not? Cut nine. I watched it before. I watched it as a kid. I watched it as a senator. I watched what happened in my community. It changed everything. What happened? What happened? I'm finding all kinds of goodies here, Joe Biden. Here he is siding with segregationists, right? You see, Joe uh, grew up way, way, way before the Internet. You could just go into a room and say stuff, and nobody would ever call you on it. And uh, so he still acts like no one actually can do anything about the crazy stuff. That he says, well, nobody really does much, but it's starting to change. Now, we do all kinds of things, but you know what? We're niche. We are. Conservative media, unfortunately, is niche. I wish it were dominant media, but we're not dominant. We're not. And um, yes, we can we can make things happen, but the agenda continues to be set by the New York Times and, and what they do. Hey, House Speaker's personal finance is in the spotlight. Finally, show Mike Johnson lists no assets on disclosure forms. Besides his house. Well, he's a working man. I don't know. <laughs> Developing story. House Speaker's personal finances in the spotlight. Well, um, and the problem is he has no money. <laughs> what, what? What? And they're busting his chops about that. What about Joe Biden? All the million, many, many millions from China, from Kazakhstan, from Romania, from Ukraine and beyond. Uh, gifted cars, uh, Porsches. Uh, luxury stays at hotel. This is, oof, but they're giving Ron Johnson a hard time. Not Ron Johnson. Uh, Mike Johnson. Great guy. Where's that stuff about? Uh, oh, yeah. Here he is being anti Semitic. Cut 18. You know, the- my son is attorney general a year in Iraq, came back, and that's one of the things that he finds is was most in need when he was over there in Iraq for a year. People would come to him and talk about what was happening to him at home in terms of foreclosures, in terms of bad loans that were being, I mean, these Shylocks who took advantage of, uh, of these women and men. While right overseas. there, anti, anti-Semitic slur, Shylock. It's a horrific, bad thing to say, and he says it, and he's a grown man, vice president of the United States. See how he gets in there, too, about bragging about Bo, right? Bragging about Bo and Bo in Iraq. At least he didn't say Bo died in Iraq, right? At that point, I think he was still alive, and then he died at Walter Reed Hospital in America of something unrelated to his service. And uh, Bo, great guy, seems like a great guy, and uh, but... Mm, Sorry, Joe, he died at home, not in war. I know if he died in war, that would somehow for you, I guess, be politically more interesting. Dare I say sexier, sellable, right? Because you're always selling when you're in politics, selling, 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 selling your uh, that big smile, your handshake or even your soul. Nate, you're in Queens. Hello. Uh, Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Nicole dropped uh, earlier. Uh, but before huh? I get to my main topic, yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, just get to your main topic. Okay, uh, so basically with regard to the uh, gentleman that was actually arrested uh, by the FBI and the feds, again, way over the top, uh, you have these paramilitary tactics, uh, SWAT team tactics, breaking down doors at 3 o'clock in the morning of otherwise law-abiding citizens. Uh, essentially, they're being targeted for political reasons. And again, this is what happens in police states. 
This is what happens in totalitarian uh, societies. That's exactly what Merrick Garland and the Justice Department is doing to people on the right, people who are conservative, people who are Trump supporters. You know, the, the Justice Department has declared them to be domestic terrorists. If you're opposed to CRT, homosexual propaganda, all this nonsense coming from the mass media, uh, the government, and the public school system. You know, again, if, if you're not, if you're opposed to the indoctrination, you know, you're supposed to be uh, you know, compliant. Yeah, I get you it, man. Know, and you know what? And you know why they send in these guys over the top like that? Uh, you know why? It's like to further tarnish MAGA. Like, you see what we got to do? You see we have to send these guys in because they're domestic terrorists, right? MAGA extremists are a threat to democracy. So the FBI is complicit in this when they send in these guys, you know, over the top with the guns and the tanks and the camouflage. Like, look at what we have to put up with. And uh, great points, great points, Nate. Uh, what do you do? What am I? I'm a medical assistant, actually. In a hospital or a, fa- a facility or where? No, a clinic. Uh, you guys, uh, that's, uh, are you a physician's assistant or a medical assistant or both? No, I'm, I'm studying to be a physician assistant. Eventually, that's the goal. But yeah, uh, I know right that's, now, I'm licensed that's, as an MA. It's a hard thing to become. I know. I got a lot of respect for that guy. Oh, in fact, my friend Tobin Thomas uh, just wished me a happy birthday. Happy birthday to Tobin. He's a physician's assistant and a Marine. Thank you, sir. Greg Kelly, entertaining and informative on the Red Apple Podcast Network. Did you ask for a three-day pause to get Yahoo? You know, I've been asking for a pause for a lot more than three days. Um, Yes. Did you ask him to pause for three days to get the hospital out? Yes. I've asked for even a longer pause for some of them. He was giggling. Joe Biden was giggling as he's talking about the pause, the timeout in the war against the terrorists. Why would we want a timeout? And he's asking for that. He's asking for that. Very strange. You know, they talk about uh, uh, Donald Trump as being inappropriate and unpresidential. He is totally presidential and totally appropriate, actually. Uh, you look at how he handled himself. He never would laugh under those circumstances. Never would grab a woman and smell her and lick her and touch her and grope her. Right. Um, at least on the public. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right? you don't do that. You just don't do that. What I'm trying to say is consensually behind the scenes, uh, people can do whatever they want to each other. Uh, but, uh, you know, Joe's been credibly accused of sexual assault, credibly, not like E. Jean Carroll. I mean, the real deal. Hey, I want to hear this little portion of an er- of an interview. Um, let's see here. This is jo- this is Donald Trump talking about the difference between. Hispanics and Latinos, which is, uh, I'm told that's what the topic is about here. That's actually a pretty interesting question. And uh, Diego, you are, you are both Hispanic and Latino, I believe, because you are from Mexico. And anybody from this side of the Atlantic Ocean who is, uh, 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 I want to say Hispanic, but <laughs> all right. Yeah. Any Hispanic who's on this side of the ocean is considered Latino. Am I right? Yes. Is that as it? As far as I'm concerned, yeah. And but, then and people in Spain are Hispanic. So every Latino is Hispanic, but not every Hispanic is Latino. Uh, I think not every Latino is Hispanic because Brazilians are Latino, but they're not Hispanic because they're from uh, they uh, they speak Portuguese, not Spanish. All right, I'm all stumped again. All right, Honestly, all right let me let me, hear, let me hear let me hear what he, well, let's hear what Trump said. <laughs> the I call Hispanic Latino. You have lots of different. Uh, different terms but uh it all means the same thing as far as i'm concerned oh that's it i thought it was going to be a long well that's kind of like the rest of us hispanic latino it all means the same thing as far as i'm concerned i mean you have english you have irish you have white i don't don't know european are you offended are we supposed to be offended by that no no it's okay all right you sure i'm not I, i mean i'm personally not offended i don't know if other people will be are they is it going down negatively uh, this thing that Trump's, I mean, he's, he's kind of right. He's 90% right. The only difference is Brazil, I'd say, because the rest is, you know, lat- Latinos versus Hispanics, 90%, you know, the same. You ever see Arnold Schwarzenegger when he went to Brazil hunting women? Oh my gosh. You got to look it up on YouTube. It is really something else that this guy is now lecturing us about climate change and decency is really a crock. All right. Now, Donald Trump, as you know, the, uh, DOJ has been weaponized against him and good for at least 
Stefanik speaking out against it. Yeah, this is a state case, but same difference. Let's see here. She writes in a letter of complaint to the State Commission on Judicial Conduct. At the start of the trial, Judge Engeron infamously smiled and posed for the cameras. After the defendant won an appellate ruling against Judge Engeron on the appropriate statute of limitations in this case, the judge simply ignored the ruling. Judge Engeron entered summary judgment against the defendant before the trial even began, without witnesses, other evidence, and cross-examination. This despite the fact there's disputed material evidence, and there's no victim of the defendant's supposed fraud. Indeed, as the trial evidence has made clear, the defendant paid back the sophisticated Wall Street banks on time, in full, with interest, as agreed. That's fascinating, isn't it? No insurance company paid a penny, and these banks and insurance companies supposedly defrauded continued to do business with the defendant. Yet Judge Engeron decreed before trial the defendant somehow committed fraud. Now the judge is holding a trial with no jury to determine how much of Tish James has requested $250 million in damages with no victims he will extract from the defendant. How does that not violate the defendant's Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial? Yeah! Good for you. Again, the whole damn culture should be doing this. If the culture, if the society, if the if we had any standards, right? But we only have standards, so, you know, one side. Other side, dude, just get them no matter what. No matter what. It shouldn't just be Elise Stefanik. It should be the Wall Street Journal. It should be the New York Times. It should be the Peoria Post. It should be Lester Holt. Everybody should be outraged by this. The man on the street, the postman, everybody. Judge Engeron has made it crystal clear he doesn't care what the defendant or his attorneys have to say. Indeed, Judge Engeron illegally gagged them. Judge Engeron told the defendant, we are not here to listen to you and what you have to say. <laughs> How can you get away with that? He told the defendant's counsel, I am not here to hear what he has to say. Now sit down. And Judge Engeron even threatened the defendant's counsel if he filed a routine motion for a directed verdict. You better not, Chris. I don't think the judge should be calling lawyers by their first name, do you? Judge Engeron and his staff are partisan Democrat donors. As recently as 2018, Judge Engeron donated to the Manhattan Democrats, even though Section 100.5 says that judges shall refrain from making a contribution to a political organization. Section 100.5 also stipulates that a judge shall prohibit members of the judge's staff from contributing more than $500 in the aggregate during any calendar year to all political campaigns for national office. Allison Greenfield, Chuck Schumer's girlfriend, we hear, has served as Judge Engeron's principal law clerk since 2019. In both 2022 and 2023, Greenfield donated in excess of $500 to political campaigns. In 2022 alone, Greenfield donated $3,335 in political donations to Democrat candidates and causes. She's already given more than $1,000 to 2023 campaigns. When President Trump's attorneys notified Judge Engeron, Judge Engeron responded by issuing an illegal gag order against President Trump's legal team. All right. Allison Greenfield. And what is going on between you and uh, Chuck Schumer? They work together. You don't go working for a partisan maniac like Chuck Schumer and then work for a judge unless there's a conspiracy to get somebody like Trump. Judge Engeron has gone on to gag the fine president. Oh, wait. OK, sorry. Judge Engeron has gone on to gag and fine President Trump for merely criticizing judges. Judge Engeron's law clerk, which is core political speech protected by the First Amendment. If anyone in America must have the constitutional right to speak out against the judge his staff, his witnesses, or the process. It's a defendant going through a process he believes is politicized and weaponized against him. To gag a defendant is un-American. It's an illegal prior restraint on the defendant's First Amendment rights, which even the progressive ACLU felt compelled to acknowledge after another Democrat judge, D.C. Obama U.S. District Court Judge Tanya Chutkin, illegally gagged President Trump. Indeed, three Democrat-appointed judges on the D.C. Circuit Court have since stayed Judge Chutkin's illegal gag order. You know, that's really interesting. When you get your order stayed, they got to come up with a better order than stayed. A better word. 
Because stay does not sound as dramatic and important as it is. Canceled. The judge's ruling was canceled. That's a bigger, that's a big, that's a better word, don't you think? Stay does not have the punch. For instance, uh, what's that judge's name? Uh, Shira Shinland. Shira Shinland, the maniac leftist judge who ruled against the NYPD, falsely labeled their practice of stop and frisk as like partially unconstitutional, you know, just total nonsense. Total nonsense. She ruled against the NYPD when my father was commissioner. And I remember very well Bloomberg and my dad, Ray Kelly, right after that verdict came down, and it was sometime in the summer of 2013, they came out and, man, they were mad. Appropriately so, because the decision was wrong, and if carried out, lives would be lost. Stop and frisk is a constitutional practice, which has been around, quite frankly, since cops. Now... They were mad and they spoke out and they were like, you know, we're going to, we're asking for an appeal. We're going to appeal this. We're going to pursue this. We're going to do The judge was wrong. The judge was this. The judge was that. Now you do hear people say, they don't say it as boldly as they did though. They were aggressive. I loved it. You often don't, you know, well, we, we will appeal and you never hear about that case again. Somebody gets convicted. Who's that crazy guy in South Carolina who uh, killed his, uh, Half his family, you know that guy with the did all the documentaries about the redhead, what the ducks and everything like that. Hi, what was that thing again? The judge? Ah, oh, no. Come on, everybody. The whole country was talking about it. The judge with the, the dogs and the family in South Carolina and all that. You guys don't know. I mean, granted, I don't know. <sighs> Hoyerman? Who? No, no. Hoyerman, South Carolina. Ted knows. I mean, not Ted. Uh, Phil knows it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, um, why was I... Um, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Let me do something else. Red Apple Audio Network listeners support veterans and their families this Veterans Day by donating to the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. All you have to do is go to redappleaudionetworks.com slash T2T. The Tunnel to Towers uh, Foundation do all they can do to support the veterans of our great country. Show your support for them this Veterans Day and go to redappleaudionetworks.com slash T2T and donate. Also, the Red Apple Audio Network is proud to support the Lee Greenwood Concert Experience this Sunday, November 12th. Wow, that's the day after tomorrow. You can send a veteran and their guest to see Lee Greenwood's All-Star Concert Experience and receive the DVD version for yourself for a $50 contribution. Learn more and support a veteran now at adoptavet.com. All right, so who's the guy? I did that whole commercial break. You didn't think that? Okay, never, sorry. Murtoff, the Murdoff, 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 the Murdoff guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, yeah, they say we're going to appeal, and you never hear about it again, right? It always. So Ray Kelly and Mike Bloomberg say we're going to appeal. And three months later, it was Halloween, they won. They won, like in a major... The appeals court said the judge was wrong, and they stayed the order. And that's another problem here. It's got to be canceled, the order. they got to be ejected, the order. It's got to be a stronger word than stayed. And they won. They were winning. And guess what? de Blasio comes in <laughs> and sides with the judge who was officially declared wrong. Judge Shira Shinlin was rebuked, disciplined, so much so, humiliated. Now, granted, you have to be a judge to really understand this because they use words like stayed and they have a way of protecting their own. But she was humiliated, so much so that Judge Shira Shinlin had to leave the bench because with this kind of mark against her, she could not continue as a judge. She couldn't look the other judges in the eye. So she, um, so she left. So it was a very egregious case. And this is uh, even more egregious than that. Even more. So it's not going to ultimately stand. I just love that she wrote this letter. Elise Stefanik, good person. Um, yeah. Mm. She went to Harvard, by the way. 
Good. Per- she's from upstate. She took over the congressional seat, I believe, after uh, Gillibrand. Has anybody seen Kristen Gillibrand? Right. She is totally and completely gone. You know what makes me really sad? When the children of like people, you know, do something really, really awful. Right. Good people, good parents. Right. Did you hear about the case in in in? L.A., the agent, the L.A. super agent represents Dolly Parton, represents um, uh, who's the singer who won the uh, who's the singer who won Miss America, Vanessa Williams, but lost Miss America after the nude pictures came out, which was a total atrocity. Um, She he his son is accused of murdering, butchering an entire family. And uh, I just feel really bad for the dad right now. And, of course, for the victims. I'll be right back. Greg Kelly Kelly. on the Red Apple Podcast Network. Uh, Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Remember Dr. Ruth? Dr. Ruth Westheimer. She became famous in the 80s uh, talking very explicitly about sex on Sunday nights on, I think it was WPLJ or Z100. And uh, it was like nobody had ever heard anything like it before on the radio. Anyway, she's just been appointed the nation's first loneliness ambassador. Uh, the nation's first loneliness ambassador. I hope that's one of those buck a year jobs, right? I mean, I just don't think that. Uh, anyway, loneliness is a problem, a uh, big problem, actually. Bill O'Reilly uh, did uh, actually writes about this sometimes, and uh, I've seen him do some interesting columns that uh, adult Americans, you know, they go years without making new friends and that kind of thing. Uh, loneliness is a problem. I don't know if Do- Dr. Ruth is the answer. I know that God can help. Uh, God can certainly help. All right, so it's Friday. Let's do this. Mimi, hello? Yes, hello. Uh, I just wanted to tell you I wrote a letter uh, to the Court of Appeals in New York City about two months ago, and I wrote a letter to the chief. I was going to give you the address to the uh, about Trump. Chief Judge Wilson, Court of Appeals, 20 Eagle Street, Albany, New York, 12207. I wrote the same thing that Sephronic wrote. And also, he's taking control of his properties uh, in uh, of, of, of 40 Wall Street, Trump Tower. Mm. No, uh, he's not, not yet. Not yet. I know. I know. It's terrible. By the way, she wrote the letter not to the guy you wrote it to. She wrote it to the New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct. And they're at 61 Broadway, Suite 1200, New York, New York, 10006. The New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct, if you want to complain about Judge Engeron. Um, okay, what, what, uh, thank you, Mimi. What's the last thing you want to say? Anything else about Rona. What about a, Rona McDaniel. What about her? That she should be, she should resign. And uh, I called up the RNC 202. All right. I mean, I get, people can find that number themselves. Uh, good for you. Uh, I like it. You're writing letters. You're making phone calls, Mimi. Keep it up. All right. You're, I am. All I right. am. And I, I, I love about- it. I love it, Mimi. I got to take some other calls now. Good luck. All right. Keep in touch and keep up with those letters and those phone calls. Uh, Patrick. Yes. Yes. I was uh, going to talk about um, veterans, but you brought up another point. Uh, that uh, why? Uh oh! What happened to him, Patrick? Well, are you, uh, wait, you, you mentioned uh, September, or January sixth, and these people that got uh, sentenced without even well, the head of the Pri- Proud Boys was he wasn't even in Washington. He's the one that got twenty two years. I know, but if Biden were impeached. And uh, Kevin jo- or Mike Johnson would become president. I keep he telling you that. You told me that the last time. That's not true. Uh, what's not true? That if if Joe Biden become it gets impeached, that he becomes uh, the Speaker of the House becomes president. That is not true. That is factually incorrect, sir. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Yes, he would. He'd be third in line. Well, number one, impeached. All right, we had this discussion the last time. You could impeach a president. I'm sure that Joe Biden will be impeached. But after the impeachment, what happens? The impeachment is a measure of the House of Representatives. Then it goes over to the U.S. Senate. And then two-thirds of the Senate has to vote to convict. If they don't, he does not get removed from office. Okay? We know this. I know this from the uh, uh, the phony impeachment of Donald Trump. Remember, they impeached him. But they couldn't remove him from office because they didn't convict him in the Senate. 
All right. So it's not happening. It's just not happening. I mean, new evidence. I mean, but the Democrats, they'll they'll ignore it. All right. But then you got to it would be a different matter to impeach Kamala Harris, who probably deserves it as well. Hey, Patrick, thank you, Uh, Adam. No, uh, Russ, what's up? Hey, did you see the FBI agent that was caught on video building Pence's gallows on January 6th and then strolling up to FBI headquarters? for? Slow a down, slow down. Did I see an uh, FBI agent uh, building those uh, those fake uh, gallows for Mike Pence? It was an FBI agent? Right, and then they have him on video strolling up to FBI headquarters where they had a, a coffee station, and he went in and had a coffee. But I really want to ask you, do you think Trump wants you to... Know, is- you know, Russ, I have a feeling you're trying... You're, you, I don't think you really believe what you just said. That's like some sort of joke. And now you're going to say what you really want to say, right? Well, I, you know, I, Russ, I don't like you and your little games, all right? All right, let's just be clear. You don't like me, and I don't like you. I do the same thing, though. I listen to some radio hosts I can't stand. It fires me you, up, Greg. and it gets me in the mood. Russ, all right, just don't play those games next time, all right? I do appreciate you as well. Adam, it's your turn. I'm, I'm not playing games with you, okay? I do like your show. I listen to it every day. But I, I agree with you on one thing and disagree on another thing. The thing I agree with you on is I'm a Democrat, and I say no pause in Israel pounding out Hamas. Keep it going. Get them out of there. I do disagree, sir, with the Ashley Bobby thing. She drunk the Trump Kool-Aid. She paid for it, sir. That's all I had to say. <laughs> well, all right. Yeah. Adam, just let me get this straight, though. All right. She drank the Trump Kool-Aid. Other than drinking Kool-Aid, what did she do wrong? What did she, she do she wrong? Went, sir, she, nobody else went there where she was broke through that window at. You break a window and you get you, you break a window and you get shot to death. Is that how it goes? Break a window. Sure. and Then a lot of people got away, got away with stuff in 2020. Adam, I appreciate it. Have a great weekend, everybody.